Welcome back to Hoops HD, college basketball fans. We are, as we record this, uh, about 15 hours from the start of the college basketball season. It is time, yes. David. If you go to the countdown, the days say zero. There is less than a day. We will, like, we're, 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 we're less than, we're 15 hours away from just a complete onslaught of college basketball. I can't wait. Basketball's back. It's, oh, what, wait, what the hell are you doing here? What? I'm going to be around chatting. <laughs> uh, yeah, around 1230 or so on uh, Tuesday afternoon, the first game, and, and about 1245, we're all going to be watch- realizing that we're watching Wisconsin Lutheran and Green Bay and realizing that, that we're really still a few hours from real games. But yeah, uh, I'm Green Chad- Bay is pretty bad. Lutheran has a chance. I'm Chad Sherwood. We've got David Griggs. Uh, we've got John Stalika down below, Rocco Miller from Bracketeer.org, and Joey Fortson with us. This is our final preseason podcast, and it is our preseason bracket show. Uh, so this is this is a pretty fun one. What we've done in this show is uh, I've gone ahead and I've been posting my conference previews on the website for the last month or so. I've taken those picks and gone ahead and ranked the teams that I've picked to make the field from 1 through 68, created a bracket with it. And I'm going to reveal that bracket and let you guys just, you know, tell me how right I am. You're not right. Oh. I haven't even seen it, but I just know you're wrong. <laughs> uh, and, you know, as we go through each line, I'll get comments from each of you and we'll, we'll go from there. We'll talk all about also discuss teams that I did not put in that you guys think will make the field. We'll discuss final four picks at the end of the show as well. Uh, does that cover everything? I think it does. Um, I, for, I, I, it, I can't think of what it doesn't cover. I okay. think you've covered it all. Well, well, well let me also just, just throw out there that there is zero science to preseason picks, in my opinion. Rocco, you do a preseason bracket also. Is there any science at all to doing your preseason picks? Or? I think, you know, I, there, there's nothing – there's no real science to it. I try to absorb as much as I can. I feel like the more information I take on, the harder it gets because you just overanalyze every conference, almost every team, and it makes it even tougher. I think yeah, better nobody's better. played yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and the difference between who is a three seed and who is a four seed is kind of like, okay, uh, yeah, sure, let me flip a coin because, the, you know, there is, like, you know, at the end of the season, we're going to have, we can argue these with, with objective data to back up our arguments, right. which is one of the reasons why I really don't believe in making brackets until around January, other than this preseason one. Well, I'll be making one Sunday. <laughs> I know you will. Based on merit. <laughs> uh, Wagner... Yeah, Joby just muted himself. I think he was going to say something about Wagner, but Wagner, <laughs> Wagner is a one seed. If they if they win their game, they might be. <laughs> it, it, it's a, it, I rank them by merit, not by how good I think they are. It's the opposite of Ken Palm. All right. If you guys all see it, we have a blank bracket up on the screen right now. So first of all, uh, David, your thoughts on the bracket today? Good looking bracket. So I got to get. I can't. How do I get the full screen mode off here? It's just it's has taken over my entire screen. Okay. I'll exit full screen. There we go. No, okay, now it's all. Back. Okay, now I can see you all again. Actually, put the full screen back up. <laughs> like, what I'm going to do is go ahead and show you guys who I think my four one seeds. I'm in my, preseason my form right now. I can't even remember how to work. <laughs> work. <laughs> There they are. My top four seeds heading into the season are in this order. Kansas, Kentucky, Duke, and Gonzaga. Uh, Chad, Michael, I really let- admire how you went out on a limb here and picked the top four teams in the poll. Really <laughs> good stuff well, right there. The, Rocco, any, any disagreement with me? I, I have one disagreement. So okay. I have, instead of Duke in that number three position, I have Virginia, uh, Joby's boys, uh, <laughs> Not nobody likes to predict them at this time of year, but I'm I'm not making that mistake for the for the third year in a row. I'm going to put them as the ACC champion, and I do think there are three legitimate uh, big time contenders uh, between Virginia, Duke, and North Carolina to win the league. Whoever does that will get the third number one. And I do like Kentucky, Kansas as top two. I have them reversed, but I think we're kind of splitting hairs on that. And I also have Gonzaga four. My disagreement is going to be as far as location goes with uh, Gonzaga. Officially, they have, uh, I think on the NCAA website, they have San Jose listed as a first-round site now, not Seattle. So take from that what you will. Yes, John is correct. Oh, the, the games are not in Seattle this year. Correct, because they are remodeling Key Arena for the new hockey team. All right. And my apologies. When you see Seattle again later, you can re- read San Jose there. That is something that I missed. And thank you guys for picking up on that for me. Uh, 
I'll get Two that fixed. Why the week. hell are they playing in – can't they play in the Dome or whatever the hell – anyway. Uh, yeah, the, the King the Dome, Dome has guys. long since been done. <laughs> wherever the wherever – the, don't, the, don't they play in a closed – Roof for, don't they have something there where the with a roof on it? Can't they play where the Seattle Pilots play baseball? I mean, really? Safeco, Safeco Field has a roof on it, but then you know there'd be it'd be pretty chilly for the fans <laughs> in still in March. Let's go ahead and and, and also show the two seat this the two line. Interesting that all of the one seeds are playing on Friday there. And and, and Joby, let me throw this over to you. I have the other two ACC teams that were mentioned already: Carolina, and Virginia. I also have Villanova. And Nevada up there in the two line. I, I mean, Nevada's your risk here. I, I personally think there are going to be four teams that, and this goes back to the one seed, there are going to be four teams that run away, at least in the regular season, uh, that are in the equivalent of a Power Five in, in, in the major conferences. And I, because they're going to get such huge gaps in their conference, I actually, and their conferences are decent, I actually think they're your number ones. Uh, Kansas being one, Kentucky being one. Another one is Villanova, who, by the way, in a, it's just a scrimmage, did beat Virginia in the scrimmage by all accounts. Um, the other one you have not listed yet. And in our HD preseason podcast, it was pretty consensus-driven that Michigan State was going to win by two or three games in the Big Ten. And the Big Ten is much better and deeper than it was last year. I think Tom Izzo does what he always does, gets that one seed. But the real discussion here is Nevada, obviously. And they have the talent. I don't say, you know, it's, hey, do you think what it deserves or do you think what the committee is going to do? I don't know. And I don't know. I have to be honest. I don't know Nevada's out-of-conference schedule well enough, but I don't think they're going to get the opportunities like Gonzaga usually schedules to be able to get past a Michigan State. Let's, let's take that out. Michigan State that could win the Big Ten by two or three games. Well, I'll tell you what here. We actually ha – I could do this uh, already here. I can put up Nevada's schedule yeah, yeah. for us. That'd be great. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at that. Yeah. If this works, David. My there we, God, there we go. Uh, right here you see they start with BYU yeah, look at tomorrow. all those teams. That is a tough schedule. <laughs> oh, everybody in the RPI team. They got the lopes. That is, wow. <laughs> uh, games against Arizona State on a neutral court at USC, at Utah, Utah State, at New Mexico is going to be a pretty good team also in there. I, I truly believe, as the cliche goes, that will fail. That ain't f going to feed the bulldog. What? I, well, I, mean, it, it, I don't see that they're, they're almost like these poor one conference teams. They can't slip up in conference sort of thing. They're going to have that throughout the whole season, how a lot of us feel about the Vermonts of the world during championship week. Maybe, but it, I mean, Joby's right in one sense, but in another thing, with the efficiency rankings and all these other other things going into the NET, wouldn't you think Nevada's efficiency rankings would be through the roof because of the weaker schedule? And it seems like there's been an effort to kind of identify how good of a team is to, to, despite their schedule. Now, again, I don't know. It's kind of our first rodeo with this. And yeah, a lot but, of people on the committee aren't exactly numbers crunchers. Yeah, but they, uh, I think one of them. Not, it's not as much. I truly believe this. And this is part of the formula that, I, you know, the Joby nitty gritty that I put together. It really, the RPI before, and I believe the net going forward, it's not as much about your net, your RPI. I mean, Southwest Missouri State's, you know, sitting with a 17, and we all knew they weren't going to make the tournament that year. Yeah. Uh, um, it's not about yours. It's about your opponents. And I think that the efficiency ranking in those Power Five conferences are going to rack up your Q1, Q2. Uh, uh, your core, your quartile ranking. Yeah. Okay. But it'll just be interesting to see. I think Nevada is really good. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if they finish ranked in the top – well, they're starting in the top ten, so why would it shock anyone that they finish there? They're going to be favored in virtually every game that they play. Now, I don't think they're going to win them all, but, I mean, they could have 29, 30 wins heading into the NCAA tournament. I mean, they are super good. They're good. and They'll, they'll be a protected seed. I just yeah. wonder – when I see, and yeah, I'm picking on it. Yeah, maybe it's North Carolina that slips up because I'm not as much of a believer in Carolina as Chad here as our ACC guy. Um, I don't think Carolina wins the ACC. Um, I think Little's great, et cetera. I think it's going to come down. I think they're going to be in the running, but it's really going to be Duke, Virginia that fights it out. And I actually think the Blue Devils 
as Chad puts out here, uh, are, are going to be the eventual winners. But probably it'll be a split. You probably won't see the sweep. You probably Special won't see the regular season Joel. sweep. And then postseason sweep. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Sleek, let me bring you in here and, and throw out four more teams. This will be the three line. Should we come up here in a second? And wow. there they are. There is the Michigan State team that we mentioned, along with Auburn, Tennessee, two more teams for the SEC, and the second Big 12 team there, Kansas State. Uh, your thoughts on these four? Uh, it looks like it's going to be an SEC party in the uh, city of Jacksonville with uh, Tennessee and Auburn and also some interesting games as far as the uh, city of Tulsa goes, hosting both of the uh, Kansas schools. I guess it's going to be a little bit closer for, I think, Kansas, for example, to Tulsa as opposed to Des Moines, which is somewhat equidistant, but would also, wouldn't also be surprised to see Michigan State eventually play their way into a Columbus pod. Yeah, and, and David, how about, the, how about these teams? Do you think I, I blew it with any of these teams, or do you think we've got the top 12 here? Uh, you probably did blow it, but we'll sort that out. After <laughs> right, so, I mean, like you said, there isn't a whole lot of science to this. Um, I, I really like this Tennessee team. Uh, I don't think you have them overseeded. Uh, I know that that's probably about where they are in the rankings, but I, I, I mean, for the SEC has three teams that could end up as protected. Well, you got them all out there, like them and Auburn. But I actually think I like Tennessee a little bit better than Auburn. Yeah. Well, well, and Rocco, I think where we're going to start, where you guys are really going to start disagreeing with me, is beyond the, these three lines because I think these top twelve teams are kind of almost nationally a consensus of the that big group here um but here comes the four seeds right now and due to some type of problem only one team showed up let me try that again we do see cincinnati there let's try again let's see if we get three more to go with them uh there we go along with ucla who is my Ooh. pick for the pac-12 Ooh. champion and the reason they they're in the protected seat is Ooh. because i want to give a protected seat to the pac-12 champion Oh, well, They're good job. To win All right, yeah. I've also got another SEC team in Mississippi State and another Big 12 team in, S in TCU there. Good, Chad. So there's some – I have a couple issues just, you know, of course it's all preseason and hypothetical right now. But the, I, I think just with some of the problems UCLA is facing right now, I'm having a hard time putting them that high. Um, they, they certainly have the talent to get there if they can uh, patch things up quickly. I think Cody Riley last week broke his wrist. So he'll be out a few weeks uh, on top of everything else they've experienced. Um, so really hard for me to envision that today, but things change quickly. And then the Cincinnati choice, uh, that I think that's a, probably a little too high for them. I, I think Mick Cronin's an incredible coach, but this roster without Clark and some others that left last year, it doesn't look nearly as strong as last year. And I think they would be, uh, they're gonna have a hard time winning their own conference um, and, and, I don't think the winner of the AAC, no matter who you pick, is going to be a protected seed. But that's, that's just my take. But by the same token, when you have out-of-conference games like Ohio State, Xavier, and UCLA, the opportunities are certainly going to be there for Cincinnati. They, yeah. always, they always seem to finish higher than what they're projected to start. I don't remember where they were ranked to start last year. I want to say it was in the 20s. And they ended up like up on the two line. Right. So they, and throughout their history, at least since Mick Cronin has been there, they, they seem to finish a lot higher than where they're being predicted to start. So I don't know if that's influencing Chad's decision or not just based on recent history. But I, I, I do feel this, if Cincinnati gets a protected seed, uh, they're losing in the round of 32. Uh, again, really my, my thinking on Cincinnati is yes, they are the, I'm projecting them as the American champ conference champion i think there's still enough strength in that conference to push somebody up but if they do if they can win that conference by a game or two maybe even pull off the double winning the conference tournament also it's tough for me to not see the american champion in the protected seat at the bottom of the protected seats but in there right. but that was my thinking uh but uh, what which is less likely to happen chad cincinnati ending up as a one seed or cincinnati winning a game in the round of 32 finally uh i i'll put my money on cincinnati as a one seed if i had a choice there <laughs> yeah uh, uh no come no thought about mississippi state make being the fourth SEC yeah, that, 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 that is a very interesting one i i mean i it's too high for me especially okay. you know i don't know you know the sec had a great year last year uh in terms of strength you know overall strength do we see a repeat um i i'm thinking kentucky's going to have more command 
uh, of that of that conference. But yeah, I mean, a team like Tennessee certainly can jump up and buy them uh, without a doubt. I'm not as big a believer in Auburn, to be honest. And Mississippi State, hey, they could make a run. I don't, I don't see the. I don't see Eric Dampier walk, walking through that door right now, though, to lead him to the, yeah, yeah, to the promised land uh, like he did back then in the day. Yeah, yeah, Mississippi State, sure, and we'll see some more SEC teams in your bracket, I know. What do you yeah. like about I don't, I don't see this. I don't, to get so many, you have to have so many teams rack up wins against each other and against the rest. What and do you like so much about that them, Everybody seems to be big on them. They're ranked really high to start the season. I mean, it's I, It's not completely unheard of, but it is a little strange to see a team that missed the tournament entirely the year yeah. before start off ranked in the teens, yet they're starting off in the teens. Yeah. And they missed it. They missed it. it. They weren't close. Yeah. You know, it's not like we're talking about, well, St. Mary's is – let's say St. Mary's was. Return everybody. They missed it by a game or two. Sure. Yeah, yeah, you know, but – yeah. Sorry, I got a little problem, screen problem here, but I think or I got fixed Notre up. Dame was returning Bonzi Colson. Yeah, yeah, Notre Dame, sure. Yeah. And I would say with a pretty good backcourt as well as some decent frontcourt pieces like Eric Coleman, it might be reminiscent of Angry Frank's team a couple of years ago that came out of nowhere and actually went to the Final Four. But as an eight seed, so, you know. Or seven. Seven, or yeah. seven, excuse me, yeah, I mean. That's where I see Mississippi State. And you're right. Guard play is so important, John. That's not to say – and this is all projection. We we're all conjecture. But right. they are a team that's probably built for March uh, a little bit more. Uh, but they're built for March. I, to get a seed, I think you're going to have to be built throughout the whole year uh, like the other teams we've listed for the most part. I, I just think that they have a very balanced team there. I mean, between the Weatherspoon brothers in the backcourt and and guys like uh, Holman and Adu and uh, – Reggie Perry, uh, th- th- I just didn't see any holes in the Mississippi State lineup. That's that's what I like about them. Uh, and real quick, we said we were doing this as we go along since we've got the protected seats oh, yeah. here. So, some big games. we got Duke-Kentucky tomorrow. We've got Michigan State-Kansas tomorrow. Uh, nobody else is – oh, uh, big under-the-radar opportunity. I don't know if we're going to see Wofford in your bracket or not, but North Carolina yeah. – going to Wofford tomorrow, really good game. And if North Carolina doesn't win that game, I think they will. But in the event that they don't, I don't think that that's at all an indicator that they can't end up as high as a two. Yeah, especially with their youth. Yeah. Yeah, Wofford's returning folks, they could easily pull that game off. Like, again, once, like you said, David, I'm not saying they will necessarily, but they did last year. Yeah, they did. Say they can't in their home – do the same. Where is that game being played? On campus. In, on that campus. Little ba- in that little band box they got so They there. did not, like, go to Columbia. No. And North Carolina will do this. Night lines. Yeah, Virginia does it as well occasionally. But North Carolina will do this. They'll, they'll go on the road, you, you know, and play against a really good, by relatively speaking, mid-major team. They've yeah. done it before. They're doing it this year. So they're, 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 Well, they've also got trapped – not not that it's going to be quite the level of going to Wofford. they got tripped to Elon coming up the first week also. To, to right, yeah. Carolina in the first yeah. week is pretty darn impressive. That, yeah. I, I, believe, I believe both of those schools have new arenas, so that's part of the reason why they they're do. going there. Right. Yeah, Wofford, I think, offered, opened last year. Elon's opening it this season. Yeah, right. Wofford opened last year against South Carolina. So. And it is interesting because you mentioned Virginia. Virginia, for instance, is going – uh, relatively early on to Angry Frank, and you could see the reason why. Where are Duke and North Carolina going? If Virginia happens to jump those guys into the top two of the ACC, where will they go on the sub? Right. They'll be playing in Columbia, South Carolina. And that Virginia is doesn't a have a game. Cool thing. Yeah. Oh, sorry to cut you off, but Virginia no. doesn't have a game like this this year, I don't think. But they've gone to George Washington, they've gone to Old Dominion, they've gone to. Where's VCU? Is VCU on the road this year? Or is it- uh, oh, yeah, I, I stand corrected. I think they are going to VCU. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, they'll play – not that VCU is a mid-major, but they'll yeah. play the really good regional teams from outside the Power Five. And they've occasionally been beaten. Green Bay got them a couple years ago. Yeah. GW got them a couple years ago. But they still ended up as a two or a one. So. A, a one seed uh, when, when GW bit them. Uh, yeah. And, and GW ended up missing the tournament, actually. Yeah, so uh, – so. Uh, yeah, Virginia. We see they're they're they've actually got VCU at home this year. They're at Maryland. And at Maryland for yeah. the Big Ten challenge, and uh, uh, Middle Tennessee State starts the Atlantis tournament. Right. So, Which is basically a bye this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah. Virginia should cruise to the final of that, but it'd be great to see them. Uh, I think they can either play Wisconsin or um, they, they'll, they'll get a pretty good game in the final if, if chalk holds. Well, the, the good news is from that schedule, while it's not the, you know, Atlanta, Atlantis, Maryland, South Carolina is not awful. It's not like Virginia's being road warriors this year, but at least the games they have at home, the bye games are not awful games. I mean, you're no, William yeah. and Mary's, you know, William and Mary's a pretty good team. VC, uh, this year they're, per, they're this yeah, year yeah. they're exceptionally good. Yeah, yeah exactly. GW is a, is a strong team to have as your bye game. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of just complete, fat on that you know on that uh, the Marshall game also circled that one that's a, that's a pretty yeah. good Marshall team. yeah yeah, yeah. Carp, Carp, Coppin State and Morgan State aside the Marshall game is great because it, it, it's a team that doesn't play defense against a team that doesn't <laughs> do anything but play defense so <laughs> good, good point. Yeah, also of course we've got the Champions Classic you know I mean Two of our yeah. one seeds are playing each other, and a one seed is playing a team that Joby thinks should be a two seed. And uh, it's a hard night to opening day. I think Michigan State yeah. should be a one seed. I'm dead serious when I say that. So, so well, you think you think four one seeds are playing tomorrow in the Champions yes, Classic? I do. I really do. Well, Michigan State finally, you know, they learned from last year. They've got the schedule again this year to get a one seed if they if they win enough games. So yeah, they learned really tough schedule. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and take a look at the teams that just missed my protected seeds here. Uh, David, let me bring you in on these. I've got – I know Whoa. I'm going get, to get, get a lot of flack on the, on the one in the Midwest, but Vatek, West Virginia, and Florida is the other three. Uh, yeah, West Virginia, the other night – or the other afternoon, I should say, losing a home charity game to Penn State. But, again, West Virginia has a tendency, and even Cincinnati before that uh, – to not play well in exhibition games. And you kind of almost wonder is, is that by design? Not that Bob Huggins wants to lose, but sometimes I think he does things. He's more concerned about working on their weaknesses than he is going to the strengths to try to win the game. So I don't read anything into that at all, that they didn't beat Penn state. Um, this is about, I, I'm kind of high on them. I typically am. Um, this is about where I'd have them. Interesting about Virginia Tech, we were really big on them when we were talking the ACC a few weeks ago, but they've lost a key player due yeah. to uh, a suspension, I think, or was he kicked out of school? It, it, it's an but, indefinite suspension. Yeah, okay. it's an indefinite suspension, but not in the Grayson Allen version of an indefinite suspension. That, that's Chris Clark, by the way. For yeah. The yeah, and he's, he's probably their best man-to-man -man defender, and he can, he's, he can play – because he can play both guard and forward in, in, in the defensive realm. He's a little more of near the basket offensively, but he runs the floor well. Uh, that's a loss. Um, yeah. But they are deep, and I still believe that even with that loss, I'm tempted them or a team I'm sure Shad will have very soon, uh, coached by your favorite coach, Jim Beheim. The, uh, either them, yeah, either of them will be the – fourth team after the big three. And that's what I was looking at here was, was, was the fourth, fourth team. Um, Rocco, another interesting game tomorrow night that nobody's really been talking about, but Florida, Florida State uh, opening night also. Yeah, yeah that's going to be a good one. I, You know, I'm actually higher on Florida than most. I don't know if it's going to happen overnight because, you know, Nembrand's going to be one of the best freshmen in the SEC, and they've got a couple key pieces back from last year. Obviously, a lot of people focusing on the loss of Chioza. How are they going to fill that gap? But um, Florida State, you know, with Leonard Hamilton last year, they were all over the map. They were hot. They were cold and then got hot in the tournament. Um, it will be a big game just because it, it could go really any direction. I could see uh, one of the two teams blowing each other out or it being a close game. Um, <laughs> probably the most impossible game to predict. But no matter what happens, it's going to matter at the end of the year uh, for seeding. So it will be a game that we have to uh, pay attention to closely. Yeah, outside of Florida, you're right, Chad. No, I mean, I guess because of the championship, Champions Classic, no one's really focusing on this. But this is a big game between two likely tournament teams. Yeah. It's a oh, yeah. And it's a big rivalry. Big and game. it should be – I think they're all sold out. It should be a raucous atmosphere. And whoever wins this, it's going to – the committee's watching this. It will be factored into the selection process. So even though it's opening night, this one's big, really big. And Sleek, I, I got to ask you about it. I, I threw your team in there in the five live, which is what really a, 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 a gut feeling for me that I think that everybody's underrating the Xavier team and that they've got a lot more and they've got a lot better coach than people are thinking. But what are your thoughts on me saying that? 
<laughs> Second think of the, the Big East. <laughs> I think the interesting thing is Xavier could wind up playing like a, a five seed towards the end of the year, but I just think they're going to be too inconsistent throughout the year to actually warrant a five based on a whole body of work. One historical footnote since the formation of the new Big East, the conference has had two protected seeds each year where Villanova has done it all five years and teams like Xavier, Creighton, Villanova, and Butler have taken turns as that second protected seed. I think there is a team that could end up as a five, but it's actually going to be Matt's team and Marquette, not the Musketeers this year. Um, not nearly as high on that Marquette team as you are, but let me show you my six seeds. Uh, they should be coming up on the screen right about now. And Joby, you mentioned Syracuse. Yeah. So there they are, along with Oregon, Butler, and Wisconsin. I'm glad you have Wisconsin, Chad. Uh, I'm very, I'm higher than probably the average person on Wisconsin. Oh, I like whiskey. I, I like uh, they, they are. They missed the tournament last year. They stumbled out of the gates. Greg Gard was. I mean, they're despite doing a great job the year before. There was talk over his job a little bit, even in some circles. Wisconsin, I think they are the team. I think you're looking at the second best team in the Big Ten this year, and I think they will. I actually think they have a chance to go up to the protected seed level, but I can't disagree where you have them right now 100% because we don't know. But I could see I, – I think a three or four is not out of the question, uh, depending how they play out of conference. I and I want to say I think it's going to be a week from tomorrow where uh, – Xavier is going to be hosting Wisconsin. So definitely pay attention to that game as yeah. far as who's going to be getting some early season momentum. Well, Xavier, unfortunately, John, they're the, uh, they're the first team uh, that Chad has up here that I have actually missing the tournament. We will Drop see off. really, 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 really wrong pretty darn quick. <laughs> because obviously I'm high on Wisconsin and not on X. You're not alone, Joby, because I think I've heard at one point Andy Katz, I think, had Xavier picked as low as eighth or ninth in the Big East. Oh, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's for that, that, made a correction. Well, if that's that. the case, I think Xavier is a part sitting in that conference. How in the world can you come to that conclusion? Well, well, <laughs> Rocco, what, what about my Pac-12 team in there, Oregon? I think you probably have them ranked higher, don't you? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got them, I think, 16 overall. So right, the last four seed. Um, just, just, and I actually had them. I, I originally had them 17. I moved them up just to get them into the protected West spot. But um, the, I don't think you're too far off there. If the Pac-12 struggles like they do all the time in non-league, the probably the first place team might end up uh, number six or seven in that seed range. Uh, so not, not too big of an issue there. I actually have Syracuse right at a six as well. But uh, yeah, like. Joby was saying, um, Xavier, I think Xavier and Butler, I think you're a little ambitious on just from my standpoint, from what we know today, they could easily outperform our expectations and get to this. So I don't have a huge issue overall. Uh, and then the, the Wisconsin pick is my first team that I've seen that I actually, I have just barely go into the NIT. And that's mainly because I'm not too thrilled about the Wisconsin schedule. Um, and I, in the Big Ten, they miss a couple of the top teams. I think they only play once. Um, so they could end up in a similar position. It's, I don't think it's as bad, but almost a similar position as last year's Nebraska. Um, but, you know, they had their chances at the Atlantis tournament. Like I said, even if they get to the final and lose to Virginia, I think that's still an impressive showing. So um, they'll have their, their chances there. But after that, I think they get a lot of cupcakes. Yeah, and NC State, uh, you know, isn't the best. They could have drawn better. The Xavier, Xavier Marquette road games are in Western Kentucky are all solid. At, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a shame because yeah, now at Marquette that's going to be a that's going to be a showdown, right? Yeah, there. It'd be big time. Yeah. That's great because I, I, while Chad's not as high on them, I would have, and I think Rocco, you mentioned it, uh, I would have had Marquette already on this board, um, and so uh, not saying they're protected seed yet or something, but I think. This is the range where I would have thrown them in. That at Marquette, Wisconsin game is going to be, you know, in-state, great stuff. And we're going to find out a lot about both teams uh, on on December 8th. Yeah, and Rocco, what I think we say about their Big Ten schedule, you look Michigan State, Purdue once each, and they're both at home. So that doesn't really give them the, the chance yeah. in the conference that, for that big Right. Game. 
Yeah, and the other thing I didn't point out, uh, but I looked at this a couple weeks ago, is you know th those Coffin State, Grambling, Savannah State, Houston Baptist, all teams we love under the radar, uh, really will hurt a resume like this if they end up near the bubble. So uh, uh, those teams will. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, they get. I mean, the, I don't know. Those are the teams really more. early in that <laughs> twenty game in schedule. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, those are all three twenty-five plus teams. So that can, <laughs> those are like. Yeah, that, those are uh, those are almost centenary award teams. Uh, David, I got to go for you here for the seven line. We just mentioned that Purdue team uh, right there, uh, well, and a team that you like is on the seven line also, David. Well, I, I mean, again, and what jumps out to me about this is just how unfair that is to North Carolina. I mean, to get <laughs> stuck playing that game in the round of thirty-two. I mean, for them to have a big year, end up as a protected seed, and get knocked out in the round of thirty-two, but. Uh, yeah, Purdue. I actually like Purdue a little more. Um, I like Washington. They're my pick to win the Pac-12, so I, I would certainly have to go higher than this. And I – Texas is interesting. I, I have more questions than answers about them. I, I, I certainly like Shaka Smart. I think that he's probably going to do better there before he's done than what he's done so far. Uh, but, again, I, I could see them being higher than that, or I could see them not even making the tournament potentially. But – it's interesting. But as, we, but as we also saw with Xavier, revenge is a dish that's best served cold. So this yeah. would be a prime opportunity for Texas to avenge their first round loss to Nevada last year. Nevada mm -hmm. was actually the, I think, the seventh seed as opposed to Texas being 10. But nonetheless, the revenge factor would kick in here. Yeah. Well, it was mentioned on the, on the Big 12 podcast, but even with the loss of Mo Bamba, I mean, we could see Texas actually gain from addition by subtraction this year. And as Chad has pointed out with a seven seed versus a 10, I actually like this Texas team. I think seven's pretty good spot for them, but I could see, I could see the ceiling is hinted at even be higher. Right. Uh, well, Rocco, let me throw the eight line up here also, uh, because we get halfway through the field or almost halfway through the field, uh, Ooh, Florida state, nice. LSU, and oh. a couple of, Wow. This is a lot of fun. I like okay. this. Um, I'm actually going to root for this, but um, <laughs> yeah, I've got Florida State a little, little bit higher, and I think probably most people do, but we all know with Leonard Hamilton, they could completely miss the tournament. They sometimes just lose control uh, of the team. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out. LSU. Uh, is an interesting one. Uh, of course, they, they're dealing with the tragic lo tragic loss of their teammate. And uh, Tremont Waters is an incredible point guard. I think he might be the best point guard in the country. So that you know how those things go. It could go either way. They could rally around it and end up way overperforming or just have a really rough year. Um, so I guess eight seed's a good way to hedge that. Um, now, George Mason is um, very ambitious, I think. I, I, li I like the team. I love the fact that they return all five guys. I think they re return the entire roster for the most part. Um, I don't think they lost anybody. So that could be good, but it's also a bunch of guys that haven't proven to be winners before. So they're going to have to get over that hump. Um, and then Western Kentucky, I think a very strong roster. Um, some some internal turmoil. I think they just had a – the point guard was arrested last week. And, oh, you know. Uh, yeah, there's uh, – yeah, yeah, No they, biggie. They, they've, got the schedule, they've got the schedule to get to the eight line if they get a couple big wins. So, I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, now, another historical footnote as it applies to George Mason, the last time they made it to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament, they were also playing in uh, D.C. at the home booth at that point in time. Would that be, uh, yeah, would that be, because Mason is a suburb. It's in a suburb outside of D.C. Are there, rules, are there rules that would come into play? No, in fact, uh, in fact they, 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 they played, in, they they played in D.C. when they went to the Final Four, actually. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just didn't know if there were new, no. you know, protection rules, you know, for uh, – or high seat. Yeah. No, it's the, only, the only time George Trust Mason me. would have been ineligible was 1998 because they were actually the host institution in what was then the MCI center. But every time they've 
the MCI slash Verizon slash Capital One Arena has hosted since then. Georgetown has been the host institution. Well, well but Joe, I think what you're asking is about about the fact that they're the eight seed playing Duke, who's the one right. seed. And seat. trust me, that crowd. Well, well, well actually, that, that game will be Virginia fans, and Mason that, fans are going to be not on Duke's side. Well, but that would be that would that would still be in Columbia, actually. Anyhow, the, the Mason yeah. game, uh, but. Uh, no, the uh, the protection rules only apply for the first round, anyhow, David. Right, and uh, th- like I gotta ask you this because I thought you had St. Louis as your A10 champion. I guess no, I had Mason. You, oh, you had Mason. Okay, I must have re- I must have confused the report with something else. I am actually with you on Western Kentucky. I, I don't know about anybody else on this line. I I think I like Florida State a little more, but this Western Kentucky team it seems about right as to how good I think they are and. Again, tomorrow, huge, huge game tomorrow that's going to determine whether or not they can probably get to the top half of the bracket or not, that game in Washington. I think if Western Kentucky wins that, it would probably end up being the biggest singular win on their profile. Uh, I don't have their schedule in front of me, but I, I, I think that would like to win at Washington, a team that will most likely not lose many home games, uh, that would be big. Well, so R- R- Rocco should address that. You're being a Washington guy. Uh, thoughts on that game? Yeah, t- I think it's going to be a tough game. I think it's a really risky opener that the, the Huskies threw together last minute to try to get a stronger schedule. They actually threw in the Auburn game too on Friday, uh, did a last minute home and home to really beef up the schedule. So it's, it's risky. I think it'll, um, I think it's going to be a really tough game. I mean, Western, this Western Kentucky roster has got a lot of talent. Um, they've had all camp to prepare and kind of dissect what the Huskies have coming back. And so, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a great game. I honestly do. I think it'll come down to probably the last couple of minutes. And, and I just want to note here, look at the Western Kentucky schedule. You see it kind of run short there by, by a few games. Uh, the reason being the new conference USA scheduling after that February 16th game against UAB, uh, they will then group all the teams into four to three different groups. So they will have four, their four final CUSA games will be against the other top four finishers in the conference at that point. So to kind of help beef up some of the power rating numbers, but they will likely get another game against a Marshall and whoever else is really good in the conference. Old Dominion or someone like that. And it has been a while since we've seen an under the radar school wearing white in the round of 32, but Western Kentucky might be good enough to do it. So. And they already play Marshall twice, so there's also a distinct possibility they could have four games against the thundering herd in the regular season. Yep, very That's possible. Yeah. yeah, and so the other thing is they're playing in Myrtle Beach, and as long as they take care of Valpo in the first round, which is not an easy game, they'll likely get West Virginia in the second round. And then another um, pretty tough game on the, on the third day, whether it be the final or the third place. Uh, yeah. the, and then they also go to Arkansas. They go. They got St. Mary's and Wisconsin coming to their house. They go to Belmont. They go to Missouri State. It's a it's a nice schedule. Yeah, for, yeah, it uh, is. For two SA team. Yeah, yeah. Which is another reason why I have them rated so high. Yeah. Uh, rated what about Mason's list? schedule? I don't want to dis, uh, you know disrupt the flow, but you know, does Mason have even close to the same number of opportunities? Yeah, because I'm not sold the A10 is going to pr- provide a ton of those. Oh, there they are, and they don't, they don't quite have that level of opportunity. I'll agree with that. But I, I think that the A-10, your, your middle and bottom tier opponents, the A-10, are better than the middle and the bottom of Conference USA. Yes. That, that, yes. <laughs> but, well, maybe better, the bottom, but, but if you're Mason, you better either win against Cincinnati, that Cincinnati game, or that Kansas State game, because then you really don't have – marquee opportunities at all I, I don't think they could win at kansas state that's yeah. uh <laughs> yeah i don't either i think kansas state's darn good and you have them where i would have them if not higher that was that was still a good job of them to get that game on the schedule i think that was something that came out last minute and then they'll also get um either baylor or ole miss depending on how they do against cincinnati so they'll, they'll have a couple of chances um well, nine line, line. David, we have some some first round matchups showing up here. There's Central Florida, Michigan, St. John's, and Loyola, Chicago. Last year's Final Four. Yeah, the Johnnies. Uh, you got into the tournament, and yes. I don't know. Uh, they did two things last year. They they beat Duke away from home, and they won at Villanova, and they didn't really beat anybody else at any point. But uh, I guess uh, you know the potential is certainly there. And um, Loyola again. There, there's another team that I like more than them that uh, we're, I don't know if they're going to make your field or not. 
But uh, I could see the – I mean, obviously they were in the Final Four last year. How can you say that they don't belong up here? I really like this UCF team if they can stay healthy. And, God, yeah. wouldn't that be fun seeing them play Florida State? Well, I think it's noteworthy to point out that uh, in St. Tulsa. John's did beat Butler last year without Shamori Pons. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's also worthy to point out that when St. John's had a full roster against Butler, they also lost by 40-some points at the <laughs> goal. And, and, and that's why I have St. John's in. I think that, that we do get some consistency finally out of them this year, which is why I think they do make the field. And we're, we're getting close to the bubble here. You know, and this is, you know, the nine seeds. We're, you know, the, these are teams that easily could be out of. Michigan in there, also another Final Four team, national runner-up last year. It's tough for you to see them not making the field. But again, uh, Joby, I don't think that they're sol- going to solidly be in either. Right. I agree with that. I, I think I, I can't actually disagree. I mean, I know you love the under radar teams. I, just from a realistic standpoint, I just don't see the committee loving under the radar teams, except I, I could Agreed. see Western Kentucky. I, I, I guess on Loyola, I kind of thinking that, that they think about what happened last year might, if this Loyola team looks like a tournament team, get them up a few extra seed lines. Just, you know, the memory of, hey, this team was in the they final four. Better, oh, they, they, better run, they better make their run through the MVC, though. Mm-hmm. You know, are they in trouble for that? I, I would agree with that. They, they got to slip over. up. I mean, we're talking one, two losses sort of thing if they want to be close to wearing white, which is what you have. Well, well given how strong the top of the Valley th- this year, they might be able to get away with uh, two or three Valley losses if they're going to be somewhat close to an at-large. But you better make K against teams like Nevada and at least win a game against Maryland at Baltimore if you're going to make that argument. Yeah. So Rocco, let me show you the 10 line, including the potential matchup for your Washington team here on, in my bracket. Uh, we've got their a second Valley team in Southern Illinois, a second A-10 team in SLU, along with uh, Louisville and USC. Go hey. ahead, rip me apart. <laughs> well, you know, I'm curious why, you know, this is a, a nitpicky bracket thing, but I'm curious why USC got to be in the West and Washington did it despite Washington being a, a better seed. But anyway, that would be a big gripe on uh, Selection Sunday if it were to happen. And it, and, it, and it comes to where teams fall on the seven line versus where teams fall on the ten line. Is Oh, is okay. So you're just slotting them that way. Okay. Texas was higher slotted than Washington. Right. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, no, that's fine. Uh, just curious, always curious about that. And, and uh, Texas I, is I'm not that bad of a trip to Salt Lake as <laughs> going to Hartford. So. Yeah. True. Well, Hartford's a bad trip for Washington, so let's hope let's hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> but, Look at the yeah. noon Thursday game. <laughs> <laughs> that would be tough. But yeah, I, I like uh, the, the St. Louis pick at ten. I think they have a schedule that can get them up to ten if they win or get an at large in the A ten. Um, I, I think USC. I'm I'm pretty high on. I think I have them as an eight seed, and I like their their roster a lot. It's just going to be a matter of not slipping up and losing games they're not supposed to um louisville i think it might be a little too early uh i know they have a great coach and he's he's been able to get some good transfers in there for this year i think they're a year away from making it into the tournament um they could easily surprise or, or like, maybe five depending on what happened <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah that's always a possibility as well and then southern illinois very nice team team i like a lot team i'll be watching a lot but um i don't think if a second, I'm thinking of this year's Valley like two years ago when Wichita State had a dominant team. They blew out all the metrics. They were like a top eight Ken Palm team, and they still got a 10 seed. Um, I think I think this year's Valley would be really similar to that year in terms of how the metrics are going to like them. A lot of that, more than ever, will factor into the net. And I just can't see – if there is two Valley teams, I think they're going to be like an 11 and a 12 or a, or a 12 and a play-in, something like that. But um, – It'd be great. It would be great to see this come true somehow. It'd be interesting to see if Illinois State could finally break through this year. If they're going to be multiple Valley teams, because the Redbirds, I think 1998 was the last time they'd actually qualified for the NCAA tournament under no I, less I a think guy. The than... Valley, yeah, I, I think the Valley's really good this year. I think it's better than what we're used to seeing. It's certainly better than what we're used to seeing out of under the radar conferences. So. I, it wouldn't shock me at all if they got two teams inside the bubble. In fact, yeah. like like I, I would I would predict and we'll predict now that both these teams I don't know if they'll be as high as an eight and a ten, but I, I could see them getting two teams inside. I actually like Southern Illinois more than Loyola. 
But I want to do a straw poll among our panel. Do you know who the Illinois State coach was the last time they made the NCAA tournament? I know they beat Tennessee in the first round, but I can't remember who the coach was. I'll give you a hint. We named an award after him last year back in March. Gene Stallings? Oh, my God. Kevin Stallings. Kevin Stallings. Kevin Stallings. Kevin Stallings. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> uh, interesting. Um, uh, Joby, let me, let me have your comments on the 11 line. I know you're dying to see who Syracuse gets to lose to. Um. <laughs> Yeah, either uh, that or make the run all the way to the Final Four. There's Houston, there's Alabama, uh, San Diego State, and Clemson. Mm -hmm. I, I actually Alabama I don't see this year. Uh, really? Alabama, what do you see in Alabama that can get them even to the NIT? I mean, you know, they lose their best player in Sexton. Their second best player is the sixth man at Virginia. Um, you know, I think Avery Johnson's – done an admirable job but I, I mean I, 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 think, think, I think Alabama's going to fall off a cliff I, I think the key to the team may, may, may be Mac and, and how Tevin Mack coming over from Texas where he had some problems and but I think he, they may have the right coach to get him squared away and uh, that may help make up for the scoring losses that they had but yeah I, I, I yeah and like I said Avery Johnson can coach uh, I, I like what he's brought to them they were a moribund program uh, um, dictionary word of the day uh, but I, I think they take a step back this year I, I don't see Alabama uh, making a run uh, to the tournament this year Houston interesting call um, boy I don't have any faith in an American team often you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not named Cincinnati uh, you know <laughs> the tournament I almost picked Q's in that and then hey go on Q's beat an overrated Tennessee team or a team that – not overrated, but a Tennessee team that also sputters in the tournament. And then, hey, you get to upset Virginia for the umpteen time. But if you're talking about teams that were form, formerly more of them, I think Clemson may be a little bit under as far yeah. as an 11 goes. Oh, yeah. I think yeah, Clemson I, – I think Clemson's going to be better than I think that. you're going to be a very – but I could see him as an 11. I mean, I mean, the thing is, that's just where the ACC is. Uh, I think they're going to make the tournament, but do they fall behind, you know, some of these other ACC teams like Louisville? I think Clemson's better than Louisville, but I could also see a scenario very easily where Louisville, um, where Chris Mack puts it together quickly and gets ahead of Clemson. Um, we'll see if the bad luck that Clemson seems to all the dark cloud of luck that seems to follow Clemson around finally breaks in their sunshine. Well, um, let me show the next four teams, which are my first four teams. Uh, they're in the – should be show, come up here in the south and the west regions, if we did this correctly. Uh, and I know you all think Marquette better than I do, but I got them against Iowa State, Indiana, and Arizona State. Rocco, your thoughts on my final four teams? I think they're all tournament teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I like – I mean, I like the fact that you have them in the bracket. Uh, I think I think all of them – could easily be argued to be higher up. Um, it also could be, I, I, I guess, I, I think at least Iowa State and Arizona State could be argued to be out. But um, I, I, I'm pretty high on all four. I think Indiana is got a really high ceiling with, with Langford and Morgan um, and, and the supporting cast. I think it, it could be potentially a really, really fun year in Bloomington. Um, I think Arizona State's got a much more balanced roster than last year with the uh, additions of Cheatham and um, and and Cherry. I think I think they're going to actually surprise a lot of people later in the year. I think it's going to take them a couple months to get rolling. Um, and then Iowa State, I like the talent. They've got some injury problems right now, um, so I think they, they'll have a little bit of an up and down. But with the strength of the Big Twelve, it's enough to get them a bid. And then Marquette, I, I think I, I have as my second Big East team right now. So. Um, certainly like them, and I like them a lot higher. Uh, of course, I only did that to set up that potential win game if they beat Iowa State against Vatek. You, yeah, you see course. that? Yeah, you had to do that. <laughs> I know you want to see Marquette against Uncle Buzz and Virginia Tech. Yes, but I think if that happens, keep an eye on Lindell Wigginton from Iowa State, who's poised to have a breakout year. Yeah, it's kind of hard to believe that Iowa State finished last in the Big Twelve last year, but somebody had to in that group of death. Yeah, uh, and, and David, I'll, I'll show the top four teams that I left out. These are in order. Uh, Arkansas, Ohio State, UConn, Davidson. Uh, just your general thoughts now on my field of one, three. Well, 
I'm well, not some other teams that I considered as well, but. Well, you're wrong, and, and okay. we all know it, and I think you know it too. Last year there <laughs> were a seven, eight teams that were – well, it was, there were seven teams in the top 25 preseason last year that didn't make the field, and there were three teams that – didn't receive a single vote that ended up as protected seeds. This is all kind of forecasting. I, I will say this of the teams you left out. I think I like Davidson the most. I think UConn, their lack of front court is really going to hurt them. I think they're going to get good fast, but they're not good quite this year. I actually like Ohio State a lot too. It wouldn't shock me if they got inside the bubble. I don't understand what you see in Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas, it came down to quite honestly, it, this was the Missouri spot here of the ex, the next SEC team because I think the conference is good enough to carry an extra. It will be good enough to carry a team in that may not really be long there, and that's kind of what I was looking at. Of mm-hmm. Who would that next SEC team be? I'll just throw up the rest of the also considers. Also, these are uh, ten more teams that I gave serious looks at: NC State, Iowa, Arizona, Vanderbilt, Illinois State, who you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Providence, SMU, Missouri, Marshall, and New Mexico. Um, let me throw out. I'm surprised that Providence wasn't strongly in your field. Okay. We um, got a big game. Is it tomorrow or the next day? Yeah. Is that the roadie game? Yeah. Or no, yeah. it's uh, – who do they open? Is it B- – who does Providence open with? Oh, Jesus. I'll, just... pull, I'll pull their schedule up while, while Jody, you want to talk about them. Yeah, no. Yeah. And it's because, remember, uh, A, I, I, I think uh, – uh, they're going to build from last year's team. They got a strong recruiting class coming in. Uh, to, and when you combine it with what they are, they're already a tournament, they already have tournament level capabilities. I actually think they're going to be in the top half of the Big East. I think they're going to be ahead of Xavier. They're going to be ahead of Butler in the standings. Um, I, not not I much of a schedule that. there that we're seeing, Joby. Yeah, I, right. I think what, well, but we're talking about where they are in the standings uh, of the Big East. I think the Big East, you're going to see them. B, I think I picked them. Either, I think I picked them third behind Marquette and uh, uh, and I mean definitely behind Villanova. And Villanova is going to win the conference by about four games. But that's Boston a fix. College, and Boston College, you know, will surprise this year. Uh, Boston College, I'm not saying they're going to make the tournament, but we will be discussing Boston College's tournament resume at some point in Hoops HD in February and March. And that's a team um, that has given Providence fits before. So. Yeah, that rivalry has a little bit of heat to it. It's not nearly the same as it used to be when it was a conference game, but they've kept it going. Uh, not as much heat as the roadie series, but Providence BC is a fun game. Yeah. Cooley, Cooley really know He's really put – I really like what he's done there. And, and so, you know, when you combine Hurley and Cooley, I mean, it's kind of like a nice one-two punch, you know, of what they did last yeah. year. Chad, there's another team that I really like that isn't in the bracket yet. I think they're going to be. I'm a little curious where Wofford was on your seed list and where they would have been in this group had they not gotten um, an auto. And I'm assuming you gave them the auto. Uh, the, the, I'll, I just put show them right there in the East region. They were my 12 seed in the East uh, and mm-hmm. as the best team that, right below the, the first four. So Okay, so you had them ahead of Arkansas. No, no, no. Yeah, well – I don't think I ranked them versus Arkansas. Arkansas oh, okay. was in the All field, right, yeah. but <laughs> they were the best team that that uh, of the of the teams that were not within the bubble. Uh, but but Rocco, looking at the list there of the teams I left out, uh, the teams also considered maybe even somebody that even leave leave on the board at all anywhere. Is there somebody that you think is my most egregious sin that we haven't discussed yet? I mean, I, we already talked about it on the SEC show. I, I, I'm higher on South Carolina than probably anybody. Uh, <laughs> the nation, yes. <laughs> I, I might be the number one uh, South Carolina. Angry is Frank is it is high on South Carolina as Rocco. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I just like the way the schedule sets up. They, they did an amazing job scheduling this year and obviously playing the SEC. You look at the top seven in the SEC or maybe even just the top six. I think the top six I think we mostly agree on. After that, there's going to be a team or two that emerges and they're going to have the games and the opportunities to uh, be comfortably in or, or certainly have a chance at the last four teams. And um, why not South Carolina? I think I like Vanderbilt a ton with the, the, the two five-star freshmen coming in. Garland, probably be – him and Waters be the two best point guards in the league. Garland might be the best pro. Uh, so the Vandy's going to be a, a lot of fun to watch. 
And then there's also, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit higher. I think the most people as well on Ole Miss um, because Kermit Davis was able to get a couple guys to stay, a couple guys to transfer, um, got Andy Kennedy's commitments from last year to, to stay committed, which is very similar to what uh, Mike Hopkins did at Washington last year. So I would uh, keep your eye on Ole Miss too as a sleeper dark horse type team. Uh, so between the certainly going to be asleep between the teams on the board and the teams you've mentioned, we have the entire SEC covered. So that's good. At least uh, yeah. uh, uh, Sleeker, let me throw up to you also the same question. Is there anybody else that that's on the board here that didn't make a field that you really think is a, is a sin? I don't know necessarily about in, I mean, it would certainly be notable if Arizona does not make the field, but given the fact that they're, recruiting is at a pretty much a big snag it's certainly not inconceivable to see him at this point yeah wouldn't surprise me if marshall actually got the auto bid out of conference usa and made western kentucky and at large hey chad i, I missed uh i think i missed a glaring one that i i just overlooked but i uh, i have texas tech comfortably getting in and i don't think we've discussed them yet no we haven't they were not on my board i did not believe that they were going to make the field at all Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of there's a large range of opinions there, but, but my take is with Chris Beard and the momentum he's built at that program, and them getting all the way to the final eight last year and playing in the Big Twelve, uh, I have a hard time seeing them getting and finishing the bottom of that league. I guess we'll see. I think that's what you're saying here. Yeah, the uh, last time Chad left him out of their pre, out of his preseason bracket was last year, and they got a three. They, they, they've only got two of their top eight scores back, and I know they do bring Matt Mooney in over from South Dakota, but I'm just, I'm just not. I love I love the Mooney transfer. I, I I'm not saying yeah, Texas player. Tech's going to be wearing white, but I most certainly think they're under consideration, and I, I think they're going to. They, I mean, if I were making the field, they would have been in my field, but uh, yeah, they they definitely being listed. I'm surprised they're not listed. Well, well, let me show David my last of my 12 seeds that we didn't reveal there. Uh, uh, South Dakota State with Mike Dome, Dome uh, yeah. one of the best players in the nation, not only under the radar, but any team in the nation, I believe. Uh, yeah. That's why Chad made Xavier a five there because he. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if those two were to play tomorrow, I would pick South Dakota State all day long. Uh, just so you know, I, I mean, they are really good. They got a big game, at least by under the radar standards, tomorrow against Grand Canyon. Uh, again, the issue that they're going to run into is opportunities or or lack thereof. The Summit League, while good, just doesn't provide them. So are they good enough to land inside the bubble? I think they are. Do I think they will? Maybe, probably not. But if I'm listing, if I had to list three or four teams that I thought could do it, uh, certainly Western Kentucky, who you have way up there, and certainly Loyola and, and uh, Southern Illinois. But I also think Walford and South Dakota State are very, very good. And I believe Mike Dom would also be on pace for possibly a 3,000-point career if he gets enough games in with the uh, Jackrabbits this year. Uh, right, And, 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 and four for is... four NCAA tournament appearances as well, should they make it back. Right. South Dakota State, you kind of have to dig to find them. I mean, we watch them, but, uh, you, you know, they're kind of not on, uh, you know, they're on premium level networks on television or their games are streamed. But if you are a fan of basketball, they are a fun team to watch. It's, it's worth logging on or, or turning in the channel 700 or whatever it is to, to, to watch them play. Uh, they're they're really good, and I don't mean that disparagingly. They are a really good team. It, it wouldn't shock me at all if they got inside the bubble. All right. well, let's run through the rest of the teams here uh, a little bit quicker, but I guess the 13 liner teams that could potentially be in that group as well. I'm a big fan of this Irvine team this year. Brock, are you probably are as well, being a West Coast guy. Uh, well, I've got Northeastern, Georgia State, and Harvard on the 13 line as well. Yeah, I think Irvine brings back the best roster in the Big West. I, I also am impressed with just how how well the Big West has turned things around. They hit rock bottom a couple of years ago, and I think they hit, were ranked 29th overall out of 32 conferences, in, uh, according to Ken Palm's metrics. And now I think they're they're projected this year to be a top 16 or 17 conference. But the upper half of the league has got a lot of great players. Like Fullerton's got Kyle Allman, and Irvine's got a a really good team coming back. Santa Barbara's got a good team. It's going to be a really fun uh, conference tournament, as always, but with, with a little bit more skill nowadays. Um, and then I, I like that Northeastern team quite a bit. Um, I'm really excited for Friday. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be in Boston like I originally was going to be, but I, I was planning to go. 
to watch Northeastern plays at Harvard on Friday night. That's going to be a fun one. That that's yeah. probably one of the better games of the night, really. It is. Yeah. Um, and quickly, the fourteen line here. Uh, I've got Eastern Michigan, Wright State, Grand Canyon, who we mentioned Hello. earlier, and Belmont as well. You have Eastern be, Michigan and uh, not Buffalo. That I, is- I'm, I'm leaning Eastern Michigan. I said this during our Under the Radar preview show. Uh, I just like them slightly better. I'm, I think that the West Clark loss for Buffalo is going to hurt more than people realize. So, Well, I, Buffalo got a really big game at, at West Virginia to open the year, probably a little bit over their heads, but a lot um, over their heads. they win that one. Uh, suddenly, he's going to be liking Buffalo. So. <laughs> Uh, Wright State, really good team. Uh, won 26 games a year ago. Have six of their top seven back. Uh, should be as good or better. Uh, the Lopes into the field. <laughs> yeah. trip, to, trip to Tulsa. Yep. Uh, the 15 line here. Now we're getting to the bottom of the barrel, really. Uh, uh, Joby, I gave you Lipscomb. Uh, I've also got SFA, Ryder, and Montana on this line. I like those teams. Those are good teams. Uh, I, I, Lipscomb, uh, Lipscomb was actually showed some uh, signs of life last year. I actually yeah. thought they were pretty, you know, reasonable under the radar team last year. Uh, but I really wish we had gotten them last year. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, uh, Salika, let me just show you here the 16 seeds. There's six I have a of them. sneaky suspicion. Boo! Oh. NC Central, Boo. Radford, Lehigh, SFPA, Hartford, and Grambling. Wrong on that one. What am I, what am I wrong on, Joey? Well, there is a team from the state of Georgia that I'd like to see in that Grambling spot. Oh, or no, not Georgia, uh, not not Grambling spot, uh, the North Carolina Central spot. Oh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll, minute, yeah. yeah, yeah. NC Central, I think, is is the best team in that MIAC. Uh, Probably are, but there anything can happen on one game, and I yeah. have belief. I know the, the biggest flack I might get on that is a pick of Hartford to win the America East over Vermont or UMBC, but. Uh, I like you on these. Scrambling really is who I'd pick to win this whack. So I mean, I can't really. Uh, before I pull the screen down, let me just go through through each of you quickly here. A- any final thoughts on on what you saw here and what I did? Anything either seating wise or team wise that we haven't discussed already? Uh, Rocco. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I definitely you threw some curveballs in here, and that was fun, and I enjoyed that because otherwise we wouldn't have a lot to discuss. So thank you. Um, but I'm really curious to see. Because uh, I can tell by the way that you put this together uh, that you're really kind of forecasting out the season and how you think it's going to play out and even into the conference championships. It'll be really fun maybe to do either a part of an episode or a full episode uh, uh, and look back at what we had at the start of the year. <laughs> I, I don't want to do that. I think it's so wrong. It's so yeah. ridiculous. Screenshot time. It's screenshot time. Right. So, there we go. And, and Joby, anything else? <laughs> No, I okay. I said my piece that uh, you have underrated Mr. Izzo for the last time. I've underrated him. I've overrated – David, every year I overrate this Auburn team. It's it's ever since Bruce well, Pearl's been except there. Except last year when you didn't have them in and they got a protected team. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm back on their bandwagon. Sleek, any other thoughts from you on it? Well, I won't be able to uh, do it this night, but I do want to allude to something that was kind of introduced last year. There was actually something called a college basketball imperialism map that's sort of like the game of risk, but you got uh, teams that keep winning throughout the year and can actually acquire another team's quote-unquote territory. So who will be uh, college basketball's ultimate champion come April? I think at the end of the day, it may end up being the whoever wins the national championship. I, I, I will not, I'd be surprised if it doesn't work out that way. And kind of on that note, uh, with that down now, not based on my bracket, but based on your own thoughts here, I want to run through each of you because uh, we're getting toward the end here. I ask you, who do you think will be in the final four this year? And who do you think the national champion is going to be? Uh, and David, let me start with you. Who are your final four? Who's your national champion? Uh, final four, I think I've, I like Gonzaga, Kansas a lot. I'm tempted to pick Nevada, although I don't know if they're going to make it all the way to the final four. So I would go with two teams that are playing tomorrow, Kentucky and – or one team that's playing tomorrow, Kentucky. And I really think Virginia bounces back in a big way and gets kind of that monkey off their back and gets all of the way to the final four. National champion, I'm going to go with Kansas. 
All right. uh, Joby, you mentioned Virginia, so why don't I turn to you next? Yeah, I actually, in a shock, do not have an ACC team in the Final Four. You might see three in the Final Eight, and they all miss. Uh, um, I'm, I am, I'm, you can't ignore, I think, Villanova, despite the graduations. I think Villanova is still darn good. Phil Booth's 40-plus in the, in the North Carolina scrimmage just shows, yeah, I know it's a scrimmage, but it shows he can take the reins and the leadership. Kansas, everybody talks about Kansas. I agree. Kansas is great. Gonzaga has now, I mean, forget, Mark Few can't win in March. You know, Mark Few is overrated. I Nope, not anymore. I think Gonzaga is right there to be able to do it. And your national champion, in a shock, don't underrate the fighting Tom Izzo's. Michigan State to win it all. You have to go out there. Yeah. Oh. In, Actually, I, I, it's really Kansas, but I have to make my point. Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you, Joe, but I do agree with you, actually. Let me throw mine out here. I do agree with you. No ACC team in the Final Four. I'm going with uh, Kentucky, Kansas, and Gonzaga. No shock there. And because I love to overrate them all years but last year, uh, my fourth Final Four team is going to be Auburn. Uh, I want to go with somebody a little bit off the beaten pack that pack path that has a good team. Uh, they've got a lot of some injury problems starting this season, but I think they come together by the end of the year. Yeah, make that run. Well, but I, I'm I'm, go, I'm going with with Kentucky to cut down the nets at the end of the okay. day. Okay, what do you think about Auburn's depth? Uh, do you think that they got enough? Do you think that they're athletic enough, or do they need to hire a, a, a big time strength and conditioning coach like George Mason's <laughs> handy in Durham? <laughs> David, he was on the eight line. You blew your chance there. Really, really. I couldn't get that. You, I could. You were hogging the screen, <laughs> uh, Rocco. Your final four. Yeah. So this is always uh, uh, it comes with a caveat because I don't want to pick four teams that all end up in the same region at the end of the year. But uh, assuming that my bracket is perfect, I'm going to say that there's a couple almost no brainers impossible to pick against. Is Kentucky playing in Louisville in the regional? I have to put Kentucky all the way to the Final Four with that kind of home court advantage. Same with Kansas and Kansas City, although the Huskies did beat Kansas and Kansas City last season. Um, and then my other two regions, I'll go with uh, a little bit of a surprise. I got Tennessee coming out of the Washington, D.C. region. Sorry, I'm looking at uh, a different bracket here. Right. And then in Anaheim, I expect a little bit more of a wild card um, and not Gonzaga. Um, I'll, I'll just – just by default – I think it'll be somebody a little bit more of a wild card. It'll be, I'll, I'll go with Nevada for the, for this exercise. Okay. And then in the final four, if that were, if those were the matchups, I would have Kentucky. Uh, I mean, it's probably unrealistic, but playing Tennessee in an all SEC final and uh, Kentucky winning the title. Kentucky winning the title. Uh, Salika, let me let you finish things off on this question. I would say I'm going to be confident about Kansas, Kentucky, and Duke making the final four. I would also give Tennessee a little bit of an edge over Michigan State as far as that final spot and as far as who was winning it all. I don't bet against Duke when it comes to playing in Minneapolis, so I think they will make it three for three. Uh, Duke, huh? Uh, Kentucky, Kansas, I think they were almost unanimous, though. Uh, and I kind of agree with that, that. Those two teams are just looking so good heading into the season. I did not have Kentucky. You did not have Kentucky other than in your modified version. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh on that note uh david we have one last order of business here before we finish our last preseason podcast and that is to crown our team of the people for the yes 2018-19 season this is an annual tradition here at hoops hd we crown a team of the people who we support unconditionally throughout the season we always go with a team with a unique story like the lopes when they were transitional Cal Baptist in their last year of D2 last season was our team of the people. Uh, yeah. David, who were the finalists this year? Well, we, we looked at a lot of teams. Yeah. Um, you, you know, we discussed – who all did we discuss? Uh, I think we looked at Chicago State because of some of the trouble that they've had. Um, we looked at Grand Canyon again uh, just because we had so much fun with them before. Um, you, uh, who, who else? We, we had some Duke, other candidates. Was, was Duke on the list? Duke was on the list, but we decided that they the, – the basic guidelines is that they have to be in a unique situation and kind of be under the sight line. And a little bit of history okay. here, uh, Chad, or anybody really that might remember – sometimes I can't remember exactly how things worked out. But we started it – it was actually like we didn't know what to do with NJIT. They were the one and only independent. And when we looked at them, we're like, this team – 
isn't half bad. And we just decided to kind of adopt them as our own Hoops HD team and give them unconditional support. And it was a lot of fun. We were tweeting at them. They, I mean, we were real interactive. It was a big year. They ended up making a postseason tournament. Their fans were great and um, all of that. And then they ultimately got into the Atlantic Sun Conference. Now, we had absolutely nothing to do with that, but it was kind of fun to kind of follow them. And we're, we were kind of big on NJIT by the end of the year. We were big fans, and we discussed just always making it NJIT, but – the second year we went with Grand Canyon. They were a transitional team. We thought they were unique because we figured that despite being a transitional team, they had a chance to finish in first place in their conference or in the top 100 of the RPI, which had never been done by a transitional team. And they did it and talk about a ton of fun. We, we still love the Lopes fans uh, interacting with them. It was, who was it the year? Was it uh, New Hampshire the year after that? Right. Uh, we had some fun with them. We sent them a preseason NIT banner. Uh, we bought one of their assistant coaches lunch, had it ordered on the air and sent to his office the next day. Don't know if he ever got it. And uh, last year, like you said, it was Kyle Baptist in their final year of Division Two. So we've always tried to have some fun with it. We've had probably our best interaction was with the Lopes and NJIT. But uh, – I don't know. Who are we looking at this year, Chad? Well, 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 David, there is one very unique story out there in college basketball that this year. That this is a team that is uh, – there's a team out there that is in its final year of Division I play because the administration has decided that they can save a ton of money by dropping down to Division Two, where you are still offering the same number of scholarships. Uh, well, well, you're still offering a, lot, a, a yeah. slightly lower number of scholarships, but uh, – the big argument for dropping down to division two is the cost of giving out these scholarships, which is the cost of giving out something for free. So yeah. we don't want to give things out for free anymore. Instead, we'd rather not do that, have less exposure for our school, have less people probably want to go, go to and enroll in our school. It makes no sense. I think it is a, um, you know, people have, have done studies uh, it happened when UAB's football decided to drop football that they said it was for financial reasons. And so he's all proved actually that the finances favored keeping football there. Very similar type of circumstance here. Uh, big dispute here as to how it even came about, whether it was the school itself that decided to yeah. drop down from D2 to D1 or whether it was the Georgia Board of Regents who has denied it. I've been in communication with them. They told me, no, it was definitely a school decision. Uh, yeah, but so here they here it is this year's team of the people and kind of we've never had a situation like this before. Um, like Chad said, they are reclassifying to Division Two. They've already filed the paperwork to do so, and their stated reasons don't make any sense. They say it's it's financially driven. Uh, well, I don't understand that because how can this be financially driven if your number one uh, source of revenue is buy games and football and basketball and suddenly as a Division II team, you're not able to do that anymore, but you still have travel costs. And the one thing that you save money on is scholarships, but that doesn't save the institution money because it's money that doesn't leave the institution. You don't save $50,000 by not writing yourself a check for $50,000, which is ultimately what a scholarship is. So something is really strange. Now, the stated reason, like when you asked the Board of, of Regents in an email, was that the school had made this decision. Um, but we have heard otherwise from Savannah, like we're not going to say who, but there's some people close to Savannah State that were actually in the program that are indicating it really wasn't the school's decision at all. And maybe it was. Well, maybe they, they decided they want to do this, and if that's the case, then great. We're still going to support them. We still want to send them out with a bang. But there's something fishy going on here. Am I like a conspiracy theorist, or is there something odd about this? They're, they recently transitioned up. I want to say it was 0405. They had a really rough transition. I think they were 7 and 79. But like anything else, they improved over time. They had a first-place finish. They've had – uh, some Olympic sports go to NCAA tournaments last year, all the way down to the end of the year, they were in the hunt for first place in their division. So what's the problem? Like, why is it, what is this doing to anybody? Why would, first of all, what is this saving them by going down? And secondly, why, if it wasn't them, were they forced to move down? Well, and, and again, like you said, I, I've heard, we've heard tell that the school said it was a, the Board of Regents decision. The Board of Regents has clearly stated it was a school decision. 
either way, somebody wants to destroy this program because you are going to destroy, destroy athletics at this school. Uh, you're going to hurt the entire school. I, I know that recently Georgia Southern came in and took over what was formerly Armstrong, was Armstrong State in the city of Savannah there, uh, but as a, as a satellite campus. But uh, I, I don't get it. I think this is a school that is making a huge, huge mistake. Uh, or somebody uh, is. So somebody's making a big mistake, but, but uh, uh, Salika, Joby, Rocco, we ready to hashtag save the Tigers? Yeah. I'm Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, like to think we've been doing that for quite some time now. Right. Um, and, and again, kind of a big week for them. I know that they're shooting over their heads. They go to Texas A&M this week. They also yeah. go to Georgia. If they're able to win one of those games, and I know it's it's an extreme long shot. I we want to do something to put this team in the spotlight because it would it, it is an incredible story. And the more people that hear it and maybe learn about it are going to ask, well, why the hell are they going down? Who made that decision? Yeah, unfortunately, on the court, that they were a very good team last year. I think they tied yeah. for the regular season title in the MIAC, but they, I just don't see them having the pieces there this year. They are uh, fun, though. They, they are, are fun. fun. Don't yeah. they have the highest uh, pace of anybody? Yeah. They're one of the fastest teams in all of yeah. the one. Yeah. yeah. All right. So save the Tigers. Get out there and save the Tigers. And – if you're a fan of a previous team of the people, the Lobes, NJIT, I know that you probably don't have anything in common with this Savannah State team, but if you enjoyed the kinship and you've enjoyed getting to know us, and I realize that's probably no one, please get behind this team. If you're a fan of UAV football and you remember what that felt like, you kind of feel like this is a program that's being treated the same way. Yeah, and, and just a quick note, uh, Ken Palm preseason has them rated with the number one tempo, the fastest team in, in the nation. Okay. Uh, he also has them rated 331st offensively and 353rd defensively. So they're, uh, in other yeah. words, they pay, play no defense. They are lousy on offense, but they move the ball but fast. They move the ball fast, yeah. Uh, but on that note, let me run through each of you. Any other final thoughts about anything heading into the season here? Uh, uh, Sleeka, let me start off with you. I think I had hinted on it a little bit earlier, so now I'll go ahead and uh, get the uh, screen share for what I was talking about. Hot, 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 hot. No, not, oh. not quite that puppet. Not Appalachian. Well, it's sort of if you want to narrow in oh, on a little, yeah. a little sliver of uh, North, a little hot, hot, hot sliver of North Carolina, or even our team of the people down here in the southeast <laughs> corner, but... That's already been covered up by Cincinnati, oddly enough. Huh. Okay. Uh, that game never even got played, but they got it yeah. already. All right. It was played last year. <laughs> yeah, they played last year. Uh, 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 Joby, how about you? Uh, I think it'll be very interesting um, to see if we have the issues that befell the Big Ten last year hit another conference, which is basically when we get – and with the increase to 20 game schedules proliferating across, uh, this is not a good thing. Enjoy this preseason uh, because they're going to be shrinking in the number of games. And what I mean by the Big Ten last year is we had four, we had a big three in the Big Ten and a fourth team in Ohio State. After that, the drop to Nebraska and Penn State, et cetera, was so stark that even and not even just for you, but it's true. Who would have ever thought we'd see a 13-5 and five type oh, Power 5 one. team not make the tournament? Understand the dark web had a role, David. Yes, it but, did. <laughs> but the fact is, will there be, with these increased size schedules, that phenomenon will only increase because they won't have the out-of-conference uh, capabilities to build up uh, to build up out of conference wins, and so you know, Big Ten last year goes something in the neighborhood of four and ten in the ACC Challenge, and that put them behind the eight ball for the remainder of the year. Will we see that? Can that sort of thing continue to grow? Uh, Rocco, I'm I'm really curious to see um, a thousand things this year, but I I think one of the big ones that I think will be a hot topic will be the net. Uh, that was just revealed in August, the new metric uh, that's a composite of uh, quite a few factors that the NCAA is going to be using. We don't really quite know the formula. Um, I won't you get, know it pretty soon. 
and yeah, and you guys did an excellent job getting uh, David Warlock on to talk about that and, and get a lot more information out there that we didn't know otherwise. And it's really encouraging to know by, I think by December, uh, we'll start to understand how that formula works. But I think, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited that they're getting away from the RPI in one sense, but in another sense, I'm concerned that uh, the more and more dollars that go into the the business that is college basketball, uh, the harder and harder it is for uh, mid-major. What what a mid-major even means, that cutoff line seems to be going higher and higher and higher every year, uh, making even it tough for the Atlantic 10, Mountain West, AAC even, to get multiple bids. Um, so I'm just curious because I would really like to see that trend to start come back to be able to have a bracket more like Chad's tonight. Um, uh, and I know, like Joby said, with the 20-game schedules in the power leagues, with the 16 teams, um, I'm sorry, like with SEC having 14 teams and ACC having 15 teams, it really um, it, it really cuts down on any opportunities at all. You've probably heard a lot about Loyola Chicago's coach, Porter Mosier, talking about how they called everybody in the Power Five conferences, Power Six, and couldn't get anybody to take a game with them. So um, I really hope we start to see some sort of trend go in the opposite direction. Uh, time will tell, but I, but I am excited for the season and, and keep your eye on the net. All right, uh, David, let me let you close things out. Okay. As always, I'm excited about like the, the under the radar teams, uh, who it's going to be this year, excited about Western Kentucky, South Dakota state, Walford. I also like UC Irvine a lot. I also like Wright state a lot. Um, y- you know, uh, Southern Illinois is is another team that's going to be fun because is is someone that does the weekly under the radar show. It's one of the things that we're always talking about. I mean, who is good enough to potentially land inside the bubble? As far as the NET goes, the impression I got uh, from David Warlock and from some others was that it was done with a lot of the the under-the-radar teams in mind. Now, it wasn't done specifically to aid them, but it was done to try and help identify – who some of the better teams were, regardless of what league that they played in. I I think that was kind of the goal of it. And I'm not a fan at all of the 20-game schedules, but I do think we are about a year or two away from college basketball adopting a flat uh, 31-game format. Uh, You can get to 31 games now if you're playing four games in an exempt tournament. Uh, There's movement, and I think it's enough movement to where we're going to see it in the next year or two to where it's just a flat 31, where everybody, whether they're in a multi-team event or not, will get 31 games. And I think that will help kind of offset uh, the 20-game schedules because it gives everyone at least 11 out-of-conference games, and it gives a team like Gonzaga 15 out-of-conference games. And, you you know, some of these under-the-radar teams, it gives them more chances to play, hopefully, better teams and well, hopefully they don't take the opportunity to schedule D2 teams. But um, all in all, that's that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. The NET, the exact formula isn't known yet, but the variables have been released. And when you have math people like Warren Nolan and, and a few others, Jerry Palm, uh, they're going to figure it out. By I, I think by the time we're about 15 games in, we're going to know exactly what it is. Right. Well, I, th- I think it's not going to be until like – Sometime in December, that would be, the NCAA is going to start releasing even the rankings. But yeah, I agree yeah. with you. By by the time we we get to January, uh, people will know how that how they how they correlate and be interesting unless, how they correlate with unless, the RPI. Unless they really are putting in, you know, this was uh, poo pooed obviously when we discussed with uh, Ken Pomeroy. Uh, but if they really do even have a basic artificial intelligence component. Uh, it will be close to impossible for them to, uh, for someone normal math to be able to constantly stay up to speed with what the formula is because it's, it will be ever changing. Well, and again, that's why it's going to be interesting to compare those numbers to RPI numbers and to some of the other metric numbers that are out there and see how they compare. And more importantly, see what the committee does with them come March when they release the field. Do, do, are we going to see them rely? Well, we're going to see some teams that would not have gotten in, in the past get in based on a net number. Uh, but February, on that note, February will be very interesting. Yep, it will be. On that note, on behalf of, uh, we've got John Sleek over there, Rocco Miller, Bracketeer, check him out at bracketeer.org over there, uh, Joby Fortson, David Griggs down below. I'm Chad Sherwood. Thanks for joining us for this, our, all of our preseason content. We are. As we record this, less than 14 hours away from the start of the season, so enjoy opening day, and we'll be back again real soon.